Of the few George Washington movies, The Crossing is one of the best. It gives viewers a glimpse into the character and resolve of George Washington and the other brave men who served with him. But is The Crossing historically accurate? And what is the untold history overlooked by the movie's writers and producers? The movie begins in 1776 as Washington's army retreats across New Jersey. They have suffered a series of disastrous defeats in New York at the hands of the British General Howe. General Howe has repeatedly outmaneuvered and defeated the inexperienced American army and the inexperienced George Washington. The British invasion represents the greatest amphibious assault in history up to that moment, bringing a force of 32,000 soldiers, or an estimated two-thirds of the British army to America. The invasion force is supplemented by the feared and despised German mercenary army called the Hessians, who are known for their tall brass hats and their refusal to take prisoners. As a result of the numerous defeats, the American army has been reduced by 90%. The enlistment of the few thousand men who still follow Washington in retreat will be up in just a few short weeks. One of the men retreating is the eager artillery officer, Alexander Hamilton, seen trying to dislodge a cannon stuck in the mud. Mr. Hamilton! General, so you shouldn't be here. The British could be anywhere. Be damned with saving one cannon. Spike it and move on. Yes, sir. The movie states that Alexander Hamilton was Washington's aide, but he did not become Washington's aide until several weeks after the Battle of Trenton. But the movie does accurately portray Washington's close relationship with Hamilton. In another twist of history, both Hamilton and Aaron Burr the man who would later kill him in a famous duel, both fought at the Battle of Trenton. But not all Americans are as eager to follow Washington as the young Hamilton. One such man is General Lee, a former British officer who has joined the revolutionary cause and wishes to replace General Washington as the commander of the Continental Forces. Lee has always wanted your command. What better way to see you lose it than to just stay where he is? Lee even refuses to unite his several thousand men with Washington quipping that the only thing worse than stupidity is Washington's fatal indecision of the mind. Fortunately for the cause, Lee is captured by a British patrol, thus temporarily ending his threat to Washington's command. Meanwhile, the revolution is on the verge of collapse. With the British in close pursuit, Washington's retreat across New Jersey comes to an end as he finds himself facing the Delaware River. Quickly gathering boats together from along the river, Washington and his army crossed the Delaware under the fire of the closing British army. Fortunately for Washington and his exhausted soldiers, Howe is convinced that the Continental Army is near its end and orders his men to stop their pursuit, believing the coming winter will finish the American army and their revolution. Less than 2,000 men, 18 guns, and we presume to fight against the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. For instance, early on in the war, he wants to attack, attack, attack. And eventually, he's gonna learn what's called the Fabian approach of the ancient Roman delayer who, when he fought Hannibal, he knew he couldn't defeat Hannibal head on, the larger, more powerful army, so he just kept withdrawing and attacking at the right time. And Washington will pick that up. But this moment in history, he can't afford to be a delayer. The army's falling apart. They're at their end here, and he knows he has to do something to save the day. We have a reprieve, a few days or weeks until the river freezes over. And when the British walk across the ice with 20,000 men? Then we retreat again. Then the way is open and they take Philadelphia. In his council where he's talking to these guys, you see this unanimity and they're, they're like colleagues and they're talking this through. The reality is we have to remember these men came from different colonies, now states, but for about 200 years they were like separate little countries and they don't get along. So like the marble head fishermen who are going to bring them across the river famously and the Virginia riflemen who've come up from Washington's home state, they don't get along at all and they start smack talking. They physically come to blows. And Washington, he's a big dude, right? And he grabs them and he starts pulling them apart and they stop fighting. Now, what kind of man is this that can stop brawling soldiers by his mere physicality? So we have almost no food, no medicine, no blankets. I'm more of a physician than a general. And I tell you, we have jaundice and dysentery. 
I think it's interesting. They not only have that, but they have lice, right, <laughs> that they're dealing with, uh, which is horribly itchy. They have this other thing, this called terrible itch thing that actually kind of forms webbing between their fingers. And then when it bursts, it spreads and it creates these these horrible boil-like features on their body. I don't know if you can imagine being that miserable. And then you're freezing cold on top of it, right? You are right, General Mercer. An army without supplies cannot endure. I propose we endure. So what's interesting is at least one historian believes we actually had enough supplies to feed our men, but we purposely had our spies go out and try to convince the, the British we didn't have the weapons and the food we needed. But that's kind of debatable amongst historians. Where is our alternative, gentlemen? Do we lay down our arms? Do we throw ourselves at the mercy of our enemy? No. So long as I command a corporal's guard, I will make some endeavor. So the key question is, right, why does he attack Trenton? Well, the fact is, George Washington at this point, I don't think it really shows that. There's another scene in the movie where George Washington lies down to get a little rest, and he's interrupted even then. He hasn't really had a full day's rest in over a year, so he's exhausted. I don't know if you've ever been there before where you haven't gotten rest and you don't think clearly like you normally do. That's George Washington, so just from a mental aspect, how difficult this is. He's considering fleeing all the way across the Allegheny Mountains to get away from the British. Washington says, my neck's not fitted for a halter or a rope. I'm not going to lose. And you don't see it in this clip, but there's an unlikely person who shows up. His name's Benedict Arnold, the future traitor. But at this time, Washington thinks he's one of his most brilliant commanders. Matter of fact, Arnold has just won a great victory on Lake Champlain in which he builds this navy out of sticks and fights off the British who have the greatest navy on the face of the earth. So he wins, he comes down to see Washington and say, what's my next command, what do I do? And it's while they're having the conversation about what they should do now, are we gonna survive? Arnold says, you can't fall back any further, it's time to attack. And Washington listens to Arnold. Washington calls for a formal council of war to decide what to do next. Arnold's advice to attack resonates with Washington's heart for aggressive warfare, but he believes in consulting all his commanders. Horatio Gates, who like General Lee, wants to supplant Washington as commander-in-chief, is invited to attend. In the movie, Gates publicly attacks General Washington's plan. I fear for your sanity, General. I fear that you are no longer fit for command. How dare you! No, sir! How dare you! But Gates was a little bit too savvy to launch a full frontal attack on Washington and his plan. And instead, he pretends to be sick as an excuse for why he can't lead the Continentals. He then requests leave from the army so he can rest. The reality is, Gates is more than enough strength to travel to speak to Congress, where he busies himself trying to block Washington's attack plans. Ironically, Washington only learns of Gates' treachery when a dispatch is given to him just as he is preparing to cross the Delaware River. I propose that on the eve of December 25th, we cross the river, march on Trenton, and attack the Hessians before dawn. Of the commanders gathered in his council of war, only one agrees that a surprise attack on Trenton is a good idea. An untold story in the movie is that, amazingly, a British spy in their midst leaves the meeting convinced the Americans will not attack Trenton and takes this message to the commanding British general of New Jersey, not realizing that the military council will eventually come to support Washington's plan to attack the Hessian outpost at Trenton. Washington knows that if he does not act, the army will simply disintegrate and the revolution will be lost. And so he orders a multi-pronged attack on Trenton. Get back quickly, boy. Over there. In this scene, when they're starting the crossing, the weather isn't horrible at first. It's cold, right? But the weather begins to drop, and you begin to get a little bit of sleet, but it begins to ice, and the boats begin to ice. And imagine how slick it is, right? Uh, you've got horses on these boats sliding around, men sliding around, right? Have you ever gotten your feet wet and it's cold? How miserable that would be? And again, a lot of these men are poorly shod. 
So their feet are going to suffer horribly. I should like to cross also, sir. Why don't you wait for the guns? Because if I open my mouth again about the loading of the guns, Glover will go mad. The likelihood that General Knox is getting on a boat and going across the river, that's not just probably not accurate because he's the overall operational commander of the crossing. It's its booming voice that everyone is going to hear. So this makes it sound like he's only concerned about his cannons and his well-being, right? That's just not historically accurate. Move that fat ass, Henry. <laughs> I know they're trying in this movie to humanize George Washington and make him one of the guys and relatable, but he is a, a country planter, a gentleman. He's not a private, right? Who's just hanging out in the bar talking in a coarse way. He really respects Henry Knox. Henry Knox is not only, as I said, the operational commander of this crossing, he's the guy that went off and went to Fort Ticonderoga and brought back all these cannon that allowed them to force the British to leave Boston. And so he has a, a great deal of esteem for Henry Knox. As a matter of fact, he's gonna eventually make him a Secretary of War. And so this, this whole scene to me is kind of bothersome. I think today we have a hard time accepting that there are people who are heroes. And so we wanna chop them down to size is kind of the modern culture. I've read a million books where they start off, Washington is not that marble image, he's a real man. And so I think this is the movie maker's attempt to make him a real man. But I think we should have him be a real man. And that was of a gentleman planter who probably wouldn't have been saying coarse things like this. My God, they're slow, sir. Can't we hurry them? We make one trip, Henry, they're at it all night. And then they marched to Trenton with us. And, and I think it's critical to point out that this is the moment when a figure, Thomas Paine, uh, has a great impact in helping this revolution. And so I want you to picture the snow starting to fall. It's freezing cold. He takes out a piece of paper and a pen and he starts writing one of the most inspirational pieces of American history. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and summer patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from service to his country. But he who stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. These inspirational words read to the troops go a long way in helping them and reminding them of why they're fighting this war, even in this desperate situation. With the leadership of Washington and Knox and the skill of Glover and his Marblehead fishermen, the Americans successfully crossed the Delaware River. The famous painting by German-American Emanuel Lutz, done 75 years after the event, has caused some controversy about what crossing the Delaware actually looked like. Foremost among the controversies is Washington standing in the boat as the Americans crossed the Delaware River. Many believe no one could stand upright while crossing an ice-swollen river. However, the boats they used to cross the Delaware were not rowboats, but Durham boats or iron ore barges which would have made them relatively secure for standing. Also, there seems to be evidence that when the Americans returned from Trenton, their Hessian prisoners jumped up and down in the boats to knock the ice off the sides and to keep warm, demonstrating that a person could not only stand in the boats, but move about in them too. In an ironic twist, during World War II, American bombers blew up the original Lutz painting during a bombing raid, something I'm sure America's British allies enjoyed. These rustics are so inept. Nearly takes the honor out of victory. Nearly. Fortunately, Lutz made a second painting of the crossing, which he brought to America in 1851. It is now 4 a.m. The Americans have successfully crossed the Delaware River, but still face a bitterly cold march of eight to 10 miles across icy and snowy roads. Washington's plan calls for eventually dividing his forces into two columns for the attack, hoping to cut off any Hessian retreat from Trenton. To coordinate this attack, Washington will introduce the first use of synchronized watches in history. 1110. As Washington and his men advance on Trenton, the blizzard becomes more pronounced. Some have argued that General Roll and his Hessians were ill-prepared for the surprise attack on their position because of the heavy snow. This would only be partially correct. 
How many Hessians in the guardhouse? Four, maybe six. But uh, they'd be sleeping, General. They made a great celebration yesterday. Before we proceed, it's important to note that almost all modern historians reject the argument that Hessian drunkenness arising from supposed Christmas Day revelry was the cause for their loss. Rather, it appears exhaustion and overconfidence were the overriding factors in their defeat. The Hessians faced several skirmishes and false alarms that caused them to always be on guard and alert. So much so, Rawl had even ordered his men to sleep in their uniforms with their weapons at the ready and had also sent them out on numerous fatiguing patrols to warn of any possible American advances. It's pretty clear that the endless patrols had taken a serious toll on Rawl and his men, so much so that even when British spies warned the colonel of advancing American forces, he tiredly responded, let them come, we will go at them with a bayonet. Rawl also had to believe that having Colonel Dunup only six miles away in nearby border town would provide him with immediate assistance if he were attacked. But it appears that Colonel Dunup was distracted by a lovely widow. Some historians even believe the young woman was none other than the famous patriot and flag designer Betsy Ross. Whatever the case, Rawl appeared to be so confident of his military superiority that he didn't even bother to take any military precautions to protect Trenton. Famously, Colonel Rawl was engaged in a card game the night before the attack. His confidence in Hessian military superiority caused him to not read the note handed to him by a loyalist spy, specifically warning him of the coming American attack, a note he foolishly slipped into his pocket and forgot about. Ironically, the next day, following the Battle of Trenton, the note was discovered on Rawls' dead body. As for the battle itself, when the Americans strike Trenton, the Hessians quickly find themselves overwhelmed by Knox's accurate cannon fire, Washington's battlefield leadership, and the death and loss of Colonel Rawls' leadership. When the engagement is over, the Hessians will have suffered 100 casualties and surrendered 900 men to the American forces. General Washington, Colonel Rawls' sword. Send it to Congress. Despite Washington's plan to cut off any form of retreat, over 500 Hessians still escaped capture. How many men have we lost? None. Wounded? None. Only two American deaths will result from the attack on Trenton, both occurring during the march and not at the hands of the Hessians, but rather from the deadly cold which quietly robs two men of their lives. Although I will add that several men were wounded, including the future president James Monroe, and a number of others might have died at a later point from wounds and exhaustion. Nevertheless, Washington understood the immense importance of this battle, declaring to his subordinate, Major Wilkerson, this is a glorious day for our nation. And make no mistake, it was. This is not a parlor game where I must pay my respects to that stinking mercenary who killed 500 of my men in Brooklyn, slaughtered them when they tried to surrender. Do you want me to weep for those bastards, men who kill for profit? This is a movie, so he is, if you will, the vehicle of communicating the American feeling towards Hessians, who are mercenaries, right? They're soldiers for hire. They're not fighting here because they believe in something, they're fighting for money. And so there's a little bit of hatred and that's compounded by the fact in the fight for New York, the Hessians were particularly brutal with their bayonet. And even to Americans when they surrendered Fort Washington, uh, Hessians attacked them again and treated them brutally. To be fair to the Hessians, the British had kind of told them a little bit of a lie that if they were captured by the Americans, the Americans would torture them and kill them. And so the Hessians are terrified of the Americans. Also, the British are paying uh, the Hessians a certain amount of money. And they are also giving them a certain allowance for food and clothing. So the Hessians quickly figure out if we take food from the Americans and clothes from the Americans and anything we need from the Americans, we have that much more money in our pockets. And, and so the Hessians get a little out of control. Now what's wild is at the end of the Battle of Trenton, you, you have 900 captives and you would think a lot of Americans would want to give a little payback 
for how brutally they were treated in the battle for New York and at Fort Washington, but they don't. And it really says a lot about Washington and his officers' command and the ideals of the Americans on how they should treat their opponents. Our own cause is at its heart. A fight against British taxation, is it not? In the end, sir, we all kill for profit. The British and the Hessians and us. This particular scene where uh, supposedly Nathaniel Green is saying we're just fighting for money like the Hessians. First of all, I don't know anywhere Nathaniel Green says this, right? So again, it's the theatrics of making a movie. They're trying to make a point that we're not any better than the Hessians, which is utterly ridiculous. First of all, George Washington has agreed to fight without pay. The signers of the Declaration, a lot of those guys not only lost their lives, but many who survived lost their fortunes. And then there's a guy by the name of Robert Morris. He's George Washington's friend, but he's the financier. Morris ends up giving so much of his personal wealth that he ends up going to debt or prison. Now, I would say that's not a man motivated by money. And then the soldiers themselves, they have no money. They're being paid in continentals that will be quickly depreciating in value. And make no mistake, the men who crossed this ice swollen river marched eight to 10 miles through a blizzard and fought the Hessians and then had to do it all over again. They had to march back, right? And recross the river again. I would say those were courageous men, not men driven by money. I'm kind of keeping leadership board of the movies I've reviewed. And of course I've reviewed Patton already. And I have also reviewed All Quiet on the Western Front. I'm gonna show you where I would rank uh, The Crossing compared to these movies. And I'm gonna put it at number three. And the reason for that, I I've identified a few historical inaccuracies in this movie that I think really stand out, but also the movie kind of has a, a made for TV feel to it. It just doesn't feel like a movie. 